Assalamu alaikum, peace be with you. Welcome to the Dean Show, and we're doing chats in cars. I don't know if you saw coffee in cars. Stay on 294 South. And I got my special guest here with us here on the Dean Show, Sheikh Asakardi. How are you doing, Sheikh? Assalamu alaikum, alhamdulillah. It's nice to be here, inshallah, alhamdulillah. All right, so we're doing something a little bit different. Actually, you were one of the original, actually, the original guests on the Dean Show. You remember that? I remember it's been at least, I think, eight years. So what we're, we made it, alhamdulillah, to another month that now, you know, Islam based on the five pillars. One, accepting that no one's worthy of worship except the creator of the heavens and earth, establishing that prayer five times a day, and then the fast. We've made it. What advice do you have for the millions of people who are out there now who are blessed to reach this month in Ramadan? Uh, so, inshallah, the, the advice that I give myself and all of them is to appreciate the blessings of Allah in this beautiful month of Ramadan. We take for granted our food, our drink, our water. We take for granted the easy lifestyle that we have. Ramadan forces us to appreciate those blessings, forces us to appreciate how much Allah has given and how much we take for granted. Ramadan is the month of the Quran, it's the month of dhikr, it's the month of dua, it's the month of prayer, it's the month of community building, it's the month of going to the masjid, it's the month of charity and zakah. Every single ritual of the religion of Islam is revived in the month of Ramadan. Even Umrah and Hajj, because our Prophet said, whoever does Umrah in the month of Ramadan, it is as if he's done a Hajj with me. So even the rewards of a Hajj are possible outside of the days of Hajj in the month of Ramadan. So Ramadan is the month of worship. Take advantage of each and every moment during this blessed month. Tell us, Sheikh, how did the news now you had this, this famous athlete that actually now it's really a trending topic. Snoop Doggy Dog actually comment on it, uh, commented on it, but uh, he was talking about Akon. These are some of the popular names, and we, you know, you know, we, we, kinda, we gotta be in tune with what's going on in the world. So uh, he had mentioned how Akon was actually out there, you know, promoting uh, in South Africa, I believe, or somewhere out in those lines, solar energy, and other people who were doing a lot of good. Now, he might not have gone in, about it in the best way, but he had made a, a comment that caught some controversy. But how could we now? I mean, you see that the Dean Show is about pr promoting purpose, out there really trying to enlighten the people. But what does Islam have to say about this? Because you do have people who will ask you, like, maybe you know, that they want to accept Islam, maybe they come, they've uh, went through this, they're going through it, or what, what does Islam stance on this, basically? Well, from a, a, a fiqh perspective, even, even before I get to the fiqh perspective, I think from a spiritual perspective, I think one of the things that we can all benefit from is that people really need to have a higher purpose or goal in life. And if they don't have that higher need or purpose, then they're trying to fulfill it in ways that uh, subhanAllah are just whatever they want to satisfy every sensual desire or craving uh, they try to numb out the senses and the fact of the matter is when we look around us in the world today when you don't have a spiritual purpose when you don't have a higher goal you just want to stuff yourself with any other type of goal or you want to follow every single whim or desire and we as Muslims are told there's the highest goal and the highest desire and that is the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I, I, I just want to say and I'm not speaking about a specific person because I don't know the, the, the person involved I don't know but I'm saying generally speaking generally speaking when a person does have that connection with Allah then so many of his or her needs are satisfied and life makes a lot of sense when you don't have that connection with Allah, then you're lost, you're wandering aimlessly, and you don't know what to do, and you're just experimenting in all types of bizarre or weird or, or fetish or this or that, or just satisfying in every single manner. And unfortunately, that's what's going to happen when you really don't have that strong connection with your Creator. Now, having said that, Islamically, from a fiqh perspective, there are definitely those types of, of phenomenon where uh, children are born and their genders are a little bit obscure. They might have, you know, X, X, Y, X, Y, Y. They might have a little bit of chromosomes that are uh, not mainstream or not the normal chromosomes that are clearly male or female. Our classical books of fiqh have discussed this from, from you know, from be the very beginnings of times. And in such cases, to have a surgery to try to rectify or to try to, you know, prefer one gender over the other, in such cases, that is completely halal. And in fact, our books of fiqh have discussed this from the beginnings of times. However, mainstream uh, Sunni law 
would not allow uh, a person who is a normal male or a normal female, by that I mean biologically, to undergo an actual operation to change that. This is the mainstream position uh, because this would be deemed, be deemed to be like challenging uh, the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Having said that, this is our law, our ethics, our morals. People of other faiths and civilizations, it's their business what they do. And it's not ours to judge them and Allah will be their judge in the hereafter. You know, we obviously as Muslims, we really want the best for all of mankind. We have love for all of mankind. And when you see someone going down an avenue, like I believe that uh, many people, they play the lotto. You'll see I was at the fruit market the other day or the supermarket and I saw people standing in line waiting to get, now they actually have vending machines where you can get the mega mega ball, lotto. So I, I'm, so I see people, they're, they're scratching the lotto ticket hoping that they're going to win it big. So do we see a lot of people turning toward all sorts of experimentation, trying all sorts of different things because now their heart now is not connected to the maker of the heart. Exactly, exactly. When you don't have a higher purpose, you try to fill your life with millions of smaller purposes and those purposes are never going to give you that internal satisfaction. There's one of my favorite quotes of Ibn al-Qayyim. Ibn al-Qayyim says there's an emptiness in the heart that is never going to be filled except with the remembrance of Allah. And there's a yearning and desire that's never going to be satisfied except with connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what we see around us, that people are thirsting for a reason to live, for a higher goal and purpose. They don't have that. And when they don't have it, then anything and everything becomes legit in the purpose of trying to find that happiness. But guess what? They're not going to find it unless, unless and until they reconnect with their creator. Let me ask you a, a quiz question. Do you know what the number one capital uh, suicide site in the world is? Uh, is it San Francisco? The Golden Gate Bridge, that's right. Really? Okay, yeah. that was just a complete guess. I mean, go, go, going off what, uh, what you were saying, uh, about people now experimenting, how would you, I mean, you'd perceive because from the outside things look good. Like for instance, when we think about Victoria's Secret, right? The husband or the wife, they go to Victoria's Secret. Other people, uh, you know, they know, you know about Victoria's Secret basically. Uh, I'm, an, I'm not that innocent, so uh, unfortunately or for, actually, you know what? There's nothing wrong with Victoria's Secrets per se. We want couples to have a healthy marriage and whatever allows them to do that, alhamdulillah, that's good. The problems would come the, the objectifying of the woman's body so publicly. Exactly. Otherwise, yeah. otherwise, there's no problem at all, you know, with the lingeries and with stuff that's being sold if it's done between the couples. But my point, what I wanted to make was, you know, the founder, you would think Roy, I believe Roy Raymond was his name, if I'm not mistaken. You know that obviously this person was a multi, multi-millionaire. He had made it to the upper enchalant. And you know he ended up jumping off this bridge? That I did not know. Wow. Okay. Interesting. So what I, and then we had recently Robin Williams because uh, many people you would perceive from the outside that things just look great. Things are going great. You look at Robin Williams, always smiling, laughing, making people laugh. But at the end of the day, people end up committing suicide. Over every, I believe, every 40 seconds, someone in the world is committing suicide. So obviously, going back to the heart, not being connected with its maker, rubbing the lotto ticket, trying everything else in the world, but you, you just, is it, is it true, in, truly in the remembrance of God, then do hearts find rest? Otherwise, you just become restless? Exactly, and what, I, what I've always advised, especially those people who are wondering, how do I know there's a God? How do I know Islam is true? My, my sincere advice to them is, is just get down on your knees raise your hands up and say, Oh, you who created me. Oh, you who is the creator of the heavens and earth. Guide me to the way that is best. Guide me to the truth. Don't even say a name because you're doubting his name. You're doubting even his existence. Okay, well then you don't lose anything by reaching out to him because once he's provided for you this much, he's created you, he's given you all that you need. He's not going to let you go. He's not going to let you go lost. We in Islam, we believe actually a very interesting thing and that is that anyone who wants guidance will get guidance. Allah does not misguide the sincere. If you truly want to know the truth, then guess what? That sincerity will automatically guide you to the truth. That's a promise. That's a guarantee, 100% guarantee that you're not going to be misguided if, and that's the big if, if you want guidance. Now, now tell me, you'll say some, some things that are quite controversial at times, but a lot of them, it just makes sense because we're used to just doing things following blind tradition but one thing I wanted to ask you about if you don't mind is like uh, do you and, and you back it up with evidence that actually the statements that you make that's that's really um, um, amazing but uh, the thobe what, what do you have something against the thobe shake uh, do I have something <laughs> against the thobe <laughs> uh, yeah um, 
No, I don't have anything against the thobe, but my point is that wearing the thobe in and of itself is not what the Prophet ﷺ told us to do. So it's not sunnah in the sense, it's not something that we are required to do. Rather, the Prophet ﷺ wore the thobe because the people of his culture and time wore a thobe. I mean, you guys got to understand this, that you know what? At the time of the Prophet ﷺ, even Abu Jahl was wearing a thobe. And he wasn't following the sunnah, was he? Right? <laughs> no, he wasn't. He's just Abu Jahl wearing what he's wearing. So Ibn al-Qayyim has a very profound statement. Ibn al-Qayyim says, the real sunnah in terms of dress is to follow the culture of your people because that is the sunnah of the Prophet He followed the culture of his people. He didn't invent a new fashion. He didn't design a new dress. He didn't come with a new dress code. He followed the culture of his people. So as long as the culture of your people is in accordance with the general rules of Islam, so your aura is covered and it's loose and, and, and. So the general rules of Islam, as long as they're followed, then you follow the code of your people. And that is why, by the way, wherever Islam has gone, the people have had different customs of dress code. The Islam of you know, the Muslims of Zimbabwe don't dress like the Muslims of Turkey. The Muslims of Turkey don't dress like the Muslims of Indonesia. The Muslims of Afghanistan don't dress like the Muslims of Saudi Arabia. There's nothing wrong with that. So therefore, the Muslims of America should dress like the people of America. So when you come in, when you come into it, to Islam, because a lot of times you'll, you'll see a brother who just is in university and be like, oh, he just accepted Islam and now he's wearing a big yes. turban on his head. The brother's got him in a thobe. <laughs> No, no, no. I, I, I think this is, I mean, we appreciate the zealousness, we appreciate the enthusiasm, but uh, this is not uh, something that needs to be done. Your Islam is not a measure of what cloth you're wearing. Your Islam really comes about your love of Allah and you're following what Allah wants you to follow. And in this case, the Prophet ﷺ did not command us to wear a specific dress code. Beautiful, beautiful. I'm glad you cleared that, cleared that up. That makes a lot of sense. Recently in Texas, did you know, I know you travel to Texas quite often, is that true? Well, I'm from Texas in the sense I was born there. I was, I'm a Houstonian. These days I'm living in Tennessee, but I'm from Texas. A reminder, I mean, it's very sad in our prayers and do I go out to the families. There was a couple, uh, a young lady who had just finished university. She put her head down to go to sleep and she ended up passing away. And also someone else recently, another Muslim who was also um, unexpectedly death had reached them. And this is just a reminder because many of the youth are out there and many of us, we, we think that this is something far away, but it's something in reality. Did you hear about these, these incidents that just happened recently? Uh, yes, this is the reality that SubhanAllah, you never know when death will come. And uh, it is Allah's qadr and decree. Uh, Allah Azza wa says in the Quran that no one dies unless and until uh, Allah's qadr has taken into effect and no one can delay their time of death. In fact, in my own extended family as well, there was a recently a very tragedy case that somebody had just finished his PhD from America and he went back home, you know, to Pakistan and he was celebrating and everybody was happy and he goes, he's got a headache and he's like 28, 29 years old and he went to go to sleep and that's it, he never woke up. And this shows you, I mean, subhanAllah, the prime of his life, he came back to try to get married, starting a new life, you know, just finished a PhD in engineering. I mean, this is like amazing, right? So happy, everybody. But then subhanAllah, trip home and that's it. So what that shows us is that every one of us needs to be prepared for that day before it comes because we don't know when it's going to come. It's not something that we're, we're preparing for. It's not something we're thinking about, but it's going to happen unexpectedly. And when it happens, we had better be prepared for it. We're going to go ahead and take a break. We're here doing something new with, the, with Sheikh Yasser Kardi. It's Ramadan. We'll be right back. We've got to pay a toll. Please subscribe to The Dean Show. Follow us on our official Facebook and Twitter pages in the links below. Please also help support The Dean Show by making a donation in the link below. Back on The Dean Show, I hope everybody's having a wonderful Ramadan. We got to stay con consistent. Alhamdulillah, we're going in 2016, almost reaching 500 episodes. We got one of the original guests. You know, we we're putting on the hijab. And we did those uh, exciting Q and A's. That was with our Sheikh right here, Yasser Qadi, Sheikh Yasser Qadi, Doctor Sheikh Yasser Qadi. Uh, tell us, we always try to now clear up the many misconceptions, and we start to get one step forward. And then some crazy lunatic, something gets associated, misrepresented in the media, or the media keeps showing this this group, ISIS, as if they represent Islam. What is your take on this? You've done a lot of talks on this topic. Yeah, so um, my point is that ISIS is not coming uh, from the tradition of Islam. 
the emergence of ISIS actually has to do with the failure of American foreign policy. That the entire destabilization of the country, having invaded Iraq, having put sanctions on it for 13 years, having destroyed the entire infrastructure, the civil society of the country is completely demolished. And on top of that, a civil war almost began between the Shiites and the Sunnis, you know, throughout the 2006, 7, 8, 9. All of this led to the complete chaos, the, 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 the destabilization of the region. And from that chaos emerged a group that tried to bring its own version of stability. If you were to remove all of that destabilization, all that chaos and all of that failed wars and whatnot, you would not have had ISIS. So what I tell, um, you know, the people here in America is that ISIS is not coming from the Quran. ISIS is coming from a failure of political, you know, foreign policies in the region. And that's why ISIS is such a unique phenomenon that in the history of Islam, we've never seen people like this going and beheading people, you know, putting them on videotape. I mean, this is so backward, burning a person alive, I mean, and, and killing Shiites left, right and center. I mean, you know, I'm a Sunni. I don't agree with Shiite theology, right? I'm not going to promote Shiite theology. But at the same time, you're going to just go kill and massacre them. Is that what Islam teaches you? I mean, you want to have a dialogue, have a dialogue. You want to debate, have a debate. But just going and killing somebody just because they're Shiite, which Khalifa in our Ummah has ever done this? The Umayyads, the Abbasids, the Ottomans, who has ever just gone and killed, killed, killed? So the fact of the matter is that this is something that we have uh, clear evidences from the Quran and Sunnah to demonstrate that these people have crossed the red line too many times. And we have, uh, we, and we're refuting them left, right, and center. But the fact of the matter is, as I said, we need to understand and contextualize where they're coming from. They're not coming from the Quran. They're coming from a complete failure of the political infrastructure of the region. Primarily, the cause of that failure is in fact our own country, that is America, and its own gross incompetencies in that region. What about, uh, what are your thoughts on when you see the media constantly focusing on this fridge element that represents maybe 0.0019% of Muslims, uh, Muslims being 1.67 billion in the world. But when you see, for instance, individuals planting, they, it was on the news not too long ago, uh, and wanting to set up Muslims by planting what was called, they called a Quran bomb. And then recently this Christian minister this Christ, Christian minister who was plotting basically to go ahead and massacre a whole town of Muslims. Did you hear about this, Shaykh? Yeah, I saw this, that there was this Christian guy wanting to actually, you know, plant some bombs and he actually had bombs in his car and uh, his news was hardly ever heard on the mainstream. We just didn't even hear a bleep. And yet when a Muslim does something, obviously we know the double standards, it's so sad. Uh, that uh, a Muslim does something, whether it's successful or unsuccessful, it becomes front you know, page news. Uh, recently, was it today or yesterday, somebody in Dallas uh, attacked the police station and wanted to kill them and whatnot. We don't even know his religion to this day. His religion didn't even come into it. Where is he coming from? What's his, you know, he's just a white Caucasian guy who wanted to kill some policemen. He went and attacked the police station and not, nothing is known about which church he would go to. His church isn't being brought into it, you know. So it's definitely something we need to just be cognizant of. The reality is, unfortunately, there does seem to be some type of double standard in this regard. And our job is to continue to point those double standards out. For the not yet Muslims who are tuning in watching the Dean Show, Sheikh, tell us in brief, someone really likes to they like the clean, simple message of Islam, the pure monotheism, connecting with the Creator, doing good, living a good life. They hear all these this misinformation out there. Uh, you mentioned earlier to really get get out, get down, to call upon God alone. What what advice do you do you give for that person? We talked about death. We touched upon it. It can come at any time. Uh, we touched about ISIS. You know, Destination. What, what, what what would you leave them with this blessed month of Ramadan for the people who are out there? We actually, I, I even know somebody who's been watching a Dean show and that person actually wants to learn how to, he, he's going to fast this month actually, but um, he's still not ready to accept Islam. But people like this who are out there, they're just seeking, searching, the heart is empty, they're scratching a the lot of tickets, you know, they're uh, wanting to try this and that, but to save them a loss of time going in the wrong direction, what advice do you give? Uh, my, advi my advice for them is that first and foremost, raise your hands up and ask the one who created you. You have to have that desire from within. Secondly, don't believe the media and the hype. Go and speak to a Muslim. Go and visit a masjid. Go and see for yourself really what, what Islam is about. Uh, and then the final point of advice is realize that uh, the, the, the ultimate question that you need to ask yourself is who created me and why did he do that? That's the ultimate question. 
who is my creator and what am I doing here? And I would say that no other religion or philosophy or system has the simplest and the most logical and the most rational answer. And that is that the one perfect being created me and we are here in order that we can venerate and praise him. And venerating and praising him and worshiping him entails many things. Of them is to be good and kind and, 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 and loving to other human beings and of them is to worship him and praise him. And that means some rituals, some prayers and that's like the fast of Ramadan that these are all aspects, these are all elements of worshiping the one true God. So the three points, number one, pray to him. Number two, visit your own local mosque or your own local community, visit Muslims. And number three, think, think, think. Think about the purpose of life and what you're doing here. And if you have those three, inshallah, God willing, you will find the answer. Last question here with Sheikh Dr. Yasser Kardi. For those who have consciously, they made a decision that Islam is the truth based on proof and evidence. They really want to get to Jannah. They have an opportunity during this month of Ramadan. What advice do you have for them? It can be really challenging and tough out there. Everything is calling you. Dun dunya is opening up to you. But now they made it to another Ramadan. What advice do you have before we conclude? Don't delay because you don't know how many other Ramadans you have left. Do not delay. If you know it's the truth, if you know made up your decision, you made up your mind, then Put your trust in the one who created you. Bismillah. Say in the name of Allah and that's it. Go for it. Sheikh, thank you very much. Did you enjoy this nice little car ride with us? I enjoyed it immensely. It was a very unique uh, unique idea and I hope inshallah we can do it again. Thank you very much. Jazakallah Haida. Thank you all. Thank you all for tuning in to the Dean Show once again. Consistency, that's really important. We try to say consistency. It's going on almost 10 years since 2006. Almost reaching 500 episodes here with one of the original guests. Enjoy your Ramadan, have a blessed Ramadan, and make it a way of life so we can continue to benefit we can go from all of this beautiful, this gift that the Creator has given us of Islam. Subscribe if you haven't already to the Dean Show. Continue to tune in. Call us if you have any questions, 1-800-662-ISLAM. We'll see you next time. Until then, peace be with you. Please subscribe to the Dean Show. Follow us on our official Facebook and Twitter pages in the links below. Please also help support the Dean Show by making a donation in the link below.